197. Natural Law. Calcedon Report number 143, July 1977. One of the most confused ideas in the history of Western thought is the concept of natural law. Because of their Christian faith or background, most men assume that it means that, because God created the world, his laws are basic to the constitution of all created being. Whether we deal with matters of physics or biology, psychology or chemistry, we deal with God's creation, and therefore God's law. Both Catholics and Protestants have commonly understood natural law in this sense. The concept of natural law, however, is essentially Greek in origin, and its Hellenic and naturalistic meaning has again and again dominated the doctrine to give it a radically anti-Christian meaning and use. The French Revolution was based on this doctrine, as was the Russian Revolution, which gave it a different name. In terms of the Greek mind-body dualism, natural law could mean two things. First, it could be a universal, an idea, and the imposition of that idea onto history. The idea was known through reason, and right reason became an equation for natural law. Plato's Republic, a blueprint for a communist society, was intended as a statement of what constitutes pure reason, or natural law, and therefore the necessary order for man and the state. The philosopher kings are therefore the voice of natural law, and the elite minority is the voice of true law. Aristotle associated natural law with matter, because mind's only universal expression was in nature. This expression of the material world is the state, and man is a political animal. The life of the state is law, and law expresses nature and justice when it gives every man his due. This meant treating equals equally and unequals unequally. Men have tried to derive a workable system of justice out of Aristotle, but have only succeeded when they have imported biblical law into it. The reason is that for Aristotle, as he stated at the beginning of his politics, the state or political community, which is the highest good of all, and which embraces all the rest, aims at good in a greater degree than any other, and at the highest good. The state is thus the voice of justice and of natural law. For Aristotle, therefore, ethics is a branch of politics, not of theology. It is thus impossible to fit either Aristotle or Plato into a Christian view of things. Biblical law declares that God is the author of all things and the only valid source of law. The repeated preface to law in Scripture is the declaration, I am the Lord. After the Enlightenment began to rethink natural law, there was a steady separation from the concept of the Christian additions to it, and the result was that natural law became the source of the theory of natural rights, that is, rights that are inherent to man and in man. Just as law is now identified with nature as separated from God, so right was identified with man apart from God. The logic of this view came into focus with the French Revolution. Revolution and its regime became the triumph of natural law and the rights of man. In the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, by the National Constituent Assembly of France, it was held that the nation is essentially the source of all sovereignty, nor can any individual or any body of men be entitled to any authority which is not expressly derived from it. Right reason was now the revolutionary regime, and natural law was whatever the state declared it to be. In Marxism, new terminology replaced the old, but the ideas remained the same. The dictatorship of the proletariat is the rule of right reason and natural law. It should be obvious why the Church's use of the term natural law has been so troublesome. It has incorporated into it too many anti-Christian premises. What a consistent Christian means by it is creation law, laws governing the universe, because God is its maker and sovereign. He knows, moreover, that creation is the handiwork and law sphere of the triune God, because Scripture, God's revealed law, so declares it. Man can understand and validly approach creation law when he is first of all under biblical law by God's grace. Only as we stand in terms of God's law, 
can we contend with the dangerous legal heresies and paganisms which surround us? Because of the prevalence of the idea that right reason is the voice of law, we have the increasing arrogance of modern science. Rebecca West, in The New Meaning of Treason, cited the belief of many scientists in their sinlessness. As an angry scientist told her, Science is reason. Why should people who live by reason suddenly become its enemies? Page 173. As Rebecca West observes, this is simply a new door into the old world of fanaticism. For us, it must be a closed door. We have the sovereign and triune God, and we have his inscriptured law. He is the maker of heaven and earth, and all things therein. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1 verse 3 The doctrine of creation is a starting point for valid sciences. As we deal with the problems of man and society, we have the clear guide of God's law, neither the reason of an intellectual elite, of would-be philosopher kings, nor the law of the state give valid law. Only God can legislate, and only God's law is true law. Man's administration of law must express God's law, not man's reason or the state's will. On any other basis, we have injustice and a world in chronic crisis. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20 states it very plainly and clearly. To the law and to the testimony of the prophets, to the law, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them.